Welcome back to the Hard But Worth It podcast. My name's Kirk. This is Mitch. We're with Icon Coaching, and we're here at the Grow Tech Fest, which is the largest tech conference north of uh, Sacramento. It's in Chico, California. We're hanging out at the beautiful big room at the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, having a great day. But you hear all this background noise because this thing's really been going all day long with all kinds of great pitches and talks and right now we're here with dick gorley who is going to share a little bit about what his company is and his role in it thank you it's great to be with you today um, i had an opportunity to do a presentation this morning on servant leadership uh, my company is called Solduck leadership um, and it's a nonprofit organization that's focused on helping to build uh, servant leaders and to create enduring great organizations. Solduck. So I, I'm curious, just in the name. So I, I think you spell it S O L D U C. That's correct. And the background on the name yeah. is I, when I was a little boy, I grew up in Seattle, um, but I spent a lot of time in the Olympic uh, Peninsula in Olympic National Park, Boy Scout camp. I climbed a lot of the mountains there. Um, my grandfather had a dairy farm and squim, which was close. So Solduck just seemed like a really great name. It would honor the indigenous peoples. And it, it really was where I learned how to be a leader and to be a servant leader. And uh, it's, uh, it means a lot to me. And so we called it that. And what we do is we encourage both business and nonprofits to develop as servant leaders then we take them through a school to do um, basically how to how to create a startup, how to how to do a social venture using a uh, lean canvas model. And then the third stage is we have an incubator where for some that we select, we'll invest some money in those and then help them uh, get going. And all throughout, there's a lot of mentoring and coaching uh, to make sure that. They're, they're never walking by themselves. Servant leadership are words that uh, sound cool together, but I think you, when you get in conversations with people, you start to realize uh, you know, definitions and understandings of what that means. So give us your kind of uh, experience or your de definition of what you mean when you say servant leadership. Okay. So... <laughs> If you go back uh, to the history of servant leadership, it really started a couple centuries ago with the major religions, whether it was Judaism, Islam, Muslim, uh, Christianity, and each kind of each one of those tribes kind of had a servant uh, focus on it because you were meant to meant to help the other people within the tribe. So that's that's where it really originated. And you'll see people like Mother Teresa or Gandhi or Abraham Lincoln that were servant leaders. And then in the 1960s, when AT&T was a big blue chip company, um, they had lots of money. And so they had a big human relations group that did a lot of study on leadership and things. One of their employees, was a gentleman named Robert Greenleaf. And Greenleaf came up with a theory that said, we can change leadership into a more positive experience if the servant, or the, if the leader becomes a servant. And what that means is there's two basic types of leadership. There's power leadership, where the person that leads the company is at the top of the pyramid. And basically they're directing people downstream there's not a lot of trust um, there's not a lot of empowerment those kind of things and and that's kind of how things have been in America for a long time on the servant leadership side you flip the pyramid and you put the leader at the bottom and so the the leaders role is to grant trust to encourage and develop the employees to empower them and to do the right thing for the customer. So it's, it's really a big paradigm shift. Now, one of the things that happened, Greenleaf really took off and became an evangelist for servant leadership. And it was good, particularly with AT&T. But it was still just a theory. And so one of the things that I've uncovered as a student of this is that there was a gap between theory and implementation. 
So you would have a lot of companies, they would go for a planning session and maybe two days or three days and you learn about it and then they go back to work and it'd be just like a regular planning session where they put the, the binder on the, on the shelf and never lived it. So servant leadership, when it works, creates a very uh, resilient and strong and positive culture. So what I'm working on is I identified over the years a need in the nonprofit space because nonprofits are notoriously poorly managed. And I've worked with about 35 over the years as a, as a volunteer. I spent most of my career in high tech in Silicon Valley. And so I would be working with these folks and I just think this shouldn't be this hard, you know? And uh, what I realized was they were not in touch with their customers. Um, they were not in touch with their employees. Uh, they didn't have the skill set either from a leadership point of view or, um, or an operations point of view. It was kind of like um, if you took a brand new student out of college and they wanted to do a nonprofit, they would typically have a domain expertise like clean water mm -hmm. and they may be passionate about that, but they don't know how to find their way to the restroom, right? And so. They, they try something or they go into something and then they fail. And so what I've done is with working with my team, we've created the Solduck Leadership Global, um, online, global Online Community. And so what happens is we, we select people to go into the program and we want it to be open to everybody and we're focusing on the diverse population um, as well as global. and. We, what we do is we put them through servant leadership school, and then after that, they, if they want, they can go through a social venture school or a startup school using Lean Canvas, which is pretty solid. You know, that's pretty much the way it's done now. And then we also teach them a lot about Jim Collins' good to great basics, you know, where you build a strong foundation with core values, a purpose, and, and a mission. So, and then, at that point, they could go back and do their own thing, or we can, if they really were committed to what we were doing, we can give them some seed money and actually do an incubator piece for them. And our goal is to create a community that's sustainable. And what we'd like to see is servant leadership cause a ripple effect, because I think there's so much anger and hatred and things like that in the world right now that we really need to find a way to come together and I know that when companies in Silicon Valley have a positive and a re reinforcing culture you have better business results and so a lot of high-tech CEOs in Silicon Valley at first were kind of like well I don't know we just we just need results but what they didn't realize was when you use servant leadership and your employees are in touch with their customers and they're making ideas, suggesting ideas for the company on how we can be better. Uh, we grant them trust so that if they make a mistake with the customer, they're not in trouble. Um, so it's a positive thing. And what happens is, in addition to the improved uh, business performance, you have lower turnover. People want to work there and uh, you, because it's a brand piece of the brand promise. It yeah. sounds like trust is very much at the bottom of this. And that's mm. often what we see in... Uh, in a lot of these models. You're talking about granting trust and building trust. How does one do that? So I think part of it is just awareness. Um, you know, when I started at IBM many, many years ago, and when I became, I went through a year of trading to learn how to be a good sales and marketing rep. And then when I became a manager, I had to go to a month long management school back in New York to learn how to be a good manager. Now, a lot of it was making sure that we were operating the HR things in accordance with what they wanted. And, and fortunately, IBM was very progressive. And so we were working on diverse things as early as 1982. Um, but you need people to be aware of what it is. And you also what, need what, to... What, what is? Aware of what? Be aware of the fact that you don't have to be in an autocratic style company because what happens with those is people get discouraged uh, it becomes toxic um, there's a lot of games played and um, 
it's just not healthy. And eventually companies that are in that mode uh, don't sustain themselves. Today I, I used two examples as positive companies. One was, um, one was HP and HP was big on servant leadership, but they didn't know how to implement it. So Packard and Hewlett wrote a book called the HP Way, which basically said, you know, this is this is what our culture is like. And if you don't see us walking around and checking in and seeing how you're doing or what ideas you have, you need to let us know because we want a place where everybody wants to be there. In the case of Patagonia, which was one of the Jim Collins's early good to great companies, um, it was started by Yvonne Chouinard. Um, and basically, he was a rock climber, and he began to see the disintegration of the rocks and the environment because of the way they were using climbing for technical climbing, pounding nails and stuff into the rocks. And so that became a passion for him. And then he started it with a small group, and the group was all very much similar from a culture point of view. Um, they, they wanted to have fun, they wanted to do good for the environment, um, and they wanted to be successful. And this was way before he got into the clothing part of the business. So from the beginning, he did what we call make meaning. And make meaning for Patagonia was how to save the earth, um, how to protect the environment. And so that's been pretty much their mantra. Um, and then well, as time went on, they went into the clothing business and things. And so now they are 50 years old. Um, they've just done their amazing company. And then what they've done is um, Yvonne decided uh, to create a trust that the company would operate under. And all those employees have full employment. Um, they're looking for other good employees to join them. But a portion of the profits that Patagonia makes is going to be used to go back into saving the environment. So you have this, it's, it's just like a kind of a perfect little situation where you have a great company, great results, you're making meaning, uh, you have employees that love your stuff, you have customers that love your stuff. I mean, you can't, I can't tell you the number of people that buy Patagonia and absolutely love it. So that's a second example. And so... Today when I spoke, I talked about why it's important for startups to start out with servant leadership um, because, and, and with the foundational model by Collins because you get things right. It's also appropriate for a company that's stagnant or has a toxic culture. That takes a little bit more work because you've got to get buy-in and, and sometimes you know people say, I don't want to buy into this. And that's fine. That's part of filtering out the bad apples. Um, but when it works, it, it's really exceptional. Yeah, I find it too, like servant leadership. I, I believe in that concept and uh, spoken on it uh, in several different ways. But I'm curious to know, how do you teach servant? Because service shows up all over our business world and it's kind of sexy customer service, right? So call, call me a, a top performing customer service rep. I'm happy to stand on stage and collect that award, right? I, I will get the praise for that. Call me a servant and I, I don't know what I feel about that, right? When you call me a servant, there's something different about service. I remember working at a nonprofit for 10 years and the banner, the, the sign that was posted above the door going into the kitchen before you'd wash dishes and all staff were required, no matter the top director to the first newest staff, we all washed dishes as part of our work duties. And above the door was, you don't know if you're a servant until you're treated like one. So there's a level of serving that we can teach but then there's just a level of servant that I don't know that how we teach that. It's more how do we model that because people can do customer service and not be a servant. How do, how do you guys do that? So 
it, it, you're making a really, really good point, and I, I share a couple stories. At, w at one point, when I was uh, still working for IBM, I was in New York for something, and I went upstate to um, basically a, a, a camp, a camp that was like a um, it was, it was kind of like a spiritual retreat place, and and I just the guy that had told me about it was the CEO at. Silicon Graphics, which did the early work on all the movies, and he was involved with it. So I thought, you know what, I'll just go and, and see what it's like. So they were really kind to me. You couldn't talk. And then when uh, they had me in for lunch, so you have lunch by yourself. And then when it was t ready to go, one of the people that was working in the kitchen came over and said, would you mind help serving us? So for me, that registered big time and it kind of went whoa and so that was a little bit of a wake-up call and then further on I think the point about servant is a servant is someone who is humble they're um, showing respect for whoever they're working with um, it doesn't mean that they're weak um, but it means that there's there's Making themselves, I don't know if vulnerable is the right word, but they're saying, you know, I'm here to support you. And I know that in the companies I've worked with over the years, I've always been focused on encouraging people, teaching people, finding people that were hurting and help them get better. And so um, it almost becomes like a caring ministry. And one of the challenges I think that servant leadership has is sometimes people think it's tied to a particular faith um, and it could be some people can do that but um, I think just in general it's some basic common sense things like the golden rule and showing respect I, I mentioned to the group here today you know I said we live in a pretty ugly world right now with what's going on and we should all be kind we should all help other people grow we should look for joy, seek joy, um, and y you do that in little bits and pieces. So what we're trying to do is just to create a ripple effect. And our organization uh, did our first customer in Accra, Ghana. Um, and it's called the Power Moms Tribe, and it's mothers with children who would like to be entrepreneurs. And so the woman who contacted me to be her coach had gone through a program at the Carlson Center at Sa Sacramento State. And so she went through the Lean Canvas, and then when she was done, she said, I I'd really like to get a mentor. So she asked around, and pretty soon I was on her radar screen. And I had done a two or three mentoring things with people in London and the Netherlands and Paris, and they were okay. But um, I said, you know, Emma, you're in, you're in the London time zone. I mean, wouldn't it be easier? If, and she said, no, I want you. So I've been working with her for almost two years. Um, a year ago, May, we launched the Power Moms Tribe online using Zoom. And all of those mothers meet for training twice a week. And then every day, Emma's encouraging them. So they're looking out for them as families, etc. cetera. And then the goal is, to, because the men in Ghana are not particularly um, um, Johnny on the spot and serving the family. Um, and I don't say that, try to be negative, but it's just a fact. And so her concept is, let's teach the mothers how to do this. And then you create family wealth. So. It's not just how do we get to the next paycheck, it's like you're creating some wealth by doing whatever it is you love. And then from there, you're, you're, you're strengthening the overall economy. And so that's gone extremely well. We're gonna expand into Kenya and Nigeria in 2024. And that's pretty much been our model. So we've, we, we used it and we made a lot of mistakes. And of course, there was a, there was a gap because from a technology point of view, they've got different systems, you know. I set up Google for them and they're like, well, we wanna just use WhatsApp, right? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I guess that's what we're gonna do is use <laughs> WhatsApp. And so 
I'll have my WhatsApp on on my phone and when I'm at night, and you know, like at two in the morning, I'll get a ping, and you know, it's one of the mothers contacting Emma early in the morning to say, "Oh, I have a problem," but I'm <laughs> seeing all this, you know, <laughs> and I'm seeing seeing the joy that she brings to them when they're struggling. And I I went through all the onboarding sessions with the 38 women that graduated from the cohort. And every one was a different story. And that just the fact that somebody took the time to listen to them was a big deal. So it's been kind of our test bed. And now we're saying, okay, we think the way to do it is train them as leaders, train them on building a company, and then continue to provide coaching and support groups as they go forward. That's great. Well, it sounds like you're doing amazing work. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you care and are so- part of the GrowTech Fest this time, or this time around. Have you been here before? No, this is my first, first year. Oh, gosh. Um, I hope they bring you back. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm really enjoying it. The work that the Chico people are doing at mm-hmm. Chico Start is extraordinary. Um, I've worked with them through One Man Cups and mm-hmm. some different other programs. And I just, uh, I think what's happening here is fantastic. And yeah. I'm delighted to be able to be a part of it. Great. Thanks for spending some time with us, Dick. Thank you. Appreciate it.